Well, I uh, appreciate the introduction, and uh, Brian, you, know, you set the expectations kind of high here. Yeah. Uh, what I'm going to do this morning is talk to you a little bit about the fisheries and fishing here in Grand Lake St. Mary's. You know, at just under 13,000 acres, this is our largest inland reservoir that's totally within the state of Ohio. Tremendous resource and has, has had certainly a storied past of problems off and on throughout the years, but has maintained really good fishing through time. And fishing's been great lately, and that's what I want to talk about. So uh, before I do that, I'm going to give you a quick overview about Ohio sport fisheries and what they mean to the state of Ohio. And then I'll step through and talk about how things are going here at Grand Lake St. Mary's. A little bit about the stocking and the perch stocking in particular that you've heard about. Um, I want to also talk about the safety of eating fish here because that's a question we often get and I want to be crystal clear about our views on that one and then sort of what's next in terms of fisheries management here at the lake. So those are the things I'm going to step through this morning. So in terms of sport fisheries here in Ohio, you know, we have a, a lot of wonderful resources. I mentioned Grand Lake being one of them. You know, we have over 120,000 acres of reservoirs throughout the state where anglers can fish, uh, about 170 of those altogether. But you can imagine how important this lake is representing a large percentage of that acreage. Uh, we also have more than 60,000 miles of rivers and streams, a big portion of that to the south in the Ohio River, uh, 451 miles of shoreline that, that Ohio anglers can enjoy, and then naturally Lake, naturally lake Erie to the north, um, two and a quarter million acres of water that provides world-class fisheries for not only black bass, but of course walleye and perch that you hear about all the time in the steelhead fishery. So um, those fisheries are enjoyed by over 1.3 million people every year. Um, when you hear license numbers about sales from annual resident fishing licenses in Ohio, the numbers tend to be between 650,000 to 700,000 a year. Uh, but we have about 10% of our licensed anglers are non-residents, and then we have other license types as well, one-day licenses and things like that. So uh, that represents over 17 million fishing trips in the state per year and generates about $3 billion for the state economy. So an important part of the economic engine, but also an important piece of um, sort of what Ohio is all about, certainly an important social component of our state. In order to meet the needs for fisheries resources, um, the Division of Wildlife um, has um, a number of different groups. Our law enforcement guys are here. Uh, one of our other groups is the Fish Management Research Group that, that Deb and Rich and I represent. So we've got a staff in the Division of Wildlife of a little over 400, and more than, slightly more than 90 of those are full-time people that work on fisheries things specifically. So they're located in one of five districts around the state, and Deb represents District 5 in Xenia. And we also have six fish hatcheries. You know, you have one right here in your neighborhood that Mort Pew runs, and uh, three research units, two up on Lake Erie, one in Sandusky, one in Fairport Harbor, and then one located in um, Hebron, which is our inland fisheries research unit. So the, the tools that we use to manage fisheries are things that most of you will be familiar with. Or at least these are the most common ones, you know, stocking, regulations, law enforcement, in the fishery monitoring and assess assessment that we commonly do, um, the sampling with nets and electrofishing equipment things. What you hear less about sometimes are the research efforts that we make, the partnerships that we have, uh, not only uh, between sister divisions uh, like parks and watercraft with wildlife, but also with the Ohio EPA, the Department of Agriculture, and with anglers throughout the state and then with the university research partners. So partnerships are a big part of things. Uh, fishing access is important. Uh, we have to provide access to the opportunities presented. Uh, habitat restoration, important part because fish need quality habitat. Uh, we do a great deal of work with aquatic invasive species and all of that is pointed at prevention being the key to keeping these nasty critters out of the state and from impacting our resources. And then a um, good bit with information and education. We have an entire group within the Division of Wildlife that's dedicated to information and education, but also within fish management and research, we do a good bit of that ourselves. Um, this work is funded from license sales. How many of you are licensed fishermen? 
So the, the dollars that you contribute through the sale of your license, or the, the purchase of your license, and the, the money that you uh, contribute by buying fishing tackle and marine fuel, which goes to the Sport Fish Restoration Fund, and then is apportioned by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife to the states in the United States, go to um, fund the work that we do. License sales, Sport Fish Restoration Fund, and then that creates fishing opportunities and maintain those, maintains those throughout the state. So on to Grand Lake St. Mary's and how things are going here. Um, what I'd like to do is step through um, one of the major tools that we use to measure fisheries, not only in Grand Lake, but in Lake Erie and also in the Ohio River, and this is called a creel survey or an angler survey. Essentially, it involves us sending out some seasonal employees to um, interview anglers when they're on the water or at an access area. And I'm guessing a number of you who encountered these folks uh, through time. They ask you how your day is going, what you're fishing for, if you've caught anything. And that's some of the information that I'm going to share today. So one of the pieces of information that's important is our creel clerks ask what anglers are seeking when they interview them. Then they ask how many hours they've been fishing on the trip that they're taking. And um, have they caught anything? Did they keep or release it? So, uh, how many, so that we can determine how many fish per hour they've caught. And then we also ask them um, what we call sort of human dimensions questions. Questions about how they're feeling regarding the regulations, the stocking, um, other things that we might be doing. And, and how they're feeling about the fishery. And I'm going to provide some of those results this morning. So creel surveys were conducted at Grand Lake St. Mary's in 2005, 2007, and in 2014. Um, I'm going to present results from 2005 and 2014 because in 2007 we had some logistical problems, some weather problems, and the results didn't provide as much information as we had hoped. So the way these surveys have worked is we begin them in April, run them typically through the end of July or early August, um, they're only conducted on weekends because that's when peak fishing activity is happening. Um, sometimes one weekend day, sometimes both. And we have variable start times for the uh, creel clerks that do the interviews. They could start anywhere from 9 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock in the morning. And that's part of the statistical design of the survey. So that's very important. Now our approaches, approaches to the surveys differ just a little bit between 2005 and 2014. In 2005, we used what we call a roving survey, and we used one clerk, so he'd hop in a boat and drive around the lake, ask people if they were doing any good, and also pull up to the bank and talk to shore fishermen, and also visit some access areas. And we did 16 survey days that year, and that gave us 178 interviews. 2014, we changed our methods a little bit, and on a big lake like this, the new methods look like they're the way to go. What we did is we used two clerks instead of one, um, we developed what we refer to as a bus route, which means these clerks drive in their cars from one access area to another, and they would visit a total of 27 access areas. And that allowed them to sample 30 days and generate considerably more interviews in 2014. This is probably the method that we'll use moving ahead uh, here at Grand Lake St. Mary's. So the first piece of information I'm going to provide you with is this, um, what we call percent seeking, or the results we get when we ask anglers what they're fishing for. So the, the three big ones, as you might expect, and this is not only true just here, but in most of our lakes around the state, are black bass, crappie, and catfish. This table shows the statewide averages from 36 reservoirs that are 500 acres or larger in size that we surveyed during 2004 to 2014. And those same reservoirs are the ones that I'm going to make some comparisons with Grand Lake on in the next few slides. So um, black bass overall in these waters, uh, about 29% of the trips that anglers were taking were specifically for those fish. Um, for crappie, about 19%, and for catfish, about 9%. But you can see things are a little bit different with these averages here at Grand Lake. Um, similar for black bass, a little higher for crappie, and considerably larger for catfish. So I'll provide some details about those in a second. But we want to look at the other species as well. Um, statewide for sunfish, about 4% of the trips reported in these larger reservoirs for sunfish. Um, very little for carp, and the, the all uh, ever present, sort of always popular anything. You know, most anglers um, are going for anything if they're not specialists. 
So there are some numbers here that look a little bit squirrely, and that's why I want to point them out. If you look at Grand Lake in 2005 and 2014 for sunfish and common carp, um, it looks like less than 1% of the anglers were fishing for them, whereas in 2014, much higher for both of those. I think that might be a result of um, the creel clerk actually pushing people a little bit harder to tell them what they were fishing for, because there's a difference in this anything group, which drops down quite a bit in 2014. Sometimes these things happen in our surveys. So I want to focus on the big three here, and then I'll provide some details about those. So in this table, what we're looking at here is the percent of anglers that are seeking um, black bass, and each of these categories represent um, results from the different reservoirs. Uh, for example, here, um, 25 of these 36 reservoirs, between 20 and 40 percent, or 20 and 39 percent of our anglers were seeking black bass. And that's the range where um, Grand Lake fits into. Very popular, as you might expect. In terms of effort in catch, statewide we have results of about 246 average hours per day on a weekend day at these 36 reservoirs. Grand Lake a little higher than that in 2005 and considerably higher than that in 2014. So a very popular bass fishery. Catch rates were about 0.52 fish per hour statewide in these 36 reservoirs. Now that sounds pretty low, but you have to remember when we look at numbers like this that they represent averages from a lot of trips, a lot of fishermen, and maybe everybody doesn't catch fish the way you do, okay? <laughs> so, uh, 2005 things were a little lower at Grand Lake, 2014 right around that state average. Okay. When we ask anglers how they felt about the quality of recent fishing here, uh, about 20% felt that the bass fishing had improved, 11% indicated that it was about the same, some felt that it had gotten worse, and um, two-thirds of folks just really didn't know. So those are important things for us to keep an eye on. In terms of anglers seeking crappie, um, similar numbers as the bass, but look where this is pointed. Um, 25 of the 36 reservoirs, less than 20% of angler trips are for crappie. Um, Grand Lake a little bit above that average, and in 2014, quite a bit above that average. So obviously, as you guys know, the crappie fishing has been good, and this has been a really good destination to catch really nice crappie in particular. In terms of effort, statewide, about 246 with um, Grand Lake really showing a lot of effort for crappie in 2014, 536 hours. And in terms of catch rates, a little bit lower than statewide average in 2014, but the quality of fish has been very good. And I, I don't know that I need to tell you that. So that's why when we see these kind of results, when we ask people how are things going in terms of the crappie fishermen, 49% are telling us that it has improved. Crappie fishing has gotten good. Um, a few felt that it stayed the same, um, small percentage felt it got worse, and um, some folks don't know. Now an additional question that we asked crappie anglers was how they were feeling about the 9-inch length limit, the 30-fish daily limit that we imposed several years ago. And it, it appears to be pretty popular. 42% of folks feel like um, things have improved. Um, some folks felt like things didn't change. A very small percentage felt that things had gotten worse, and less than half felt that they didn't know. Um, these are the kind of results on the crappie regulations that we see throughout the state in reservoirs where we have applied them, uh, where we really feel they're working well. So that's, that's been an effective regulation, not only here, but in other places for us. So on to catfish. Um, catfish are uh, certainly sought by considerably fewer anglers in these larger reservoirs than black bass or crappie. Uh, but that's not the case here at Grand Lake St. Mary's, uh, well above the state average, both in 2005 and 2014. In terms of effort, of course, uh, with uh, fewer people seeking catfish in the reservoirs, uh, the hours, average hours per day are lower statewide, but considerably higher at Grand Lake and catch rates here are also considerably higher. Good catfish fishery, and I know you've had a lot of very successful tournaments in the past couple of years that have pointed that out. 
So some folks felt that fishing improved. Uh, very few felt like it had gotten worse. And so catfish, again, a uh, fishery that we're feeling pretty good about. The last of these creel survey related questions I'm going to provide information on is pointed at the yellow perch fishery. You know, we started stocking yellow perch here in the lake in 2012, and we did that with the hopes that we could jumpstart the population that already exists here and get these things rolling so they would naturally reproduce and bump up the population a bit. And so anglers are, are reporting that they have caught a few yellow perch. You know, we don't know necessarily if these are ones that were stocked by us or they were already in the lake. But this is the kind of question we felt was interesting to ask, and it does provide a little bit of insight for us. So in terms of stocking, um, yellow perch stocking this year was remarkable. You know, we, uh, we set, set the goal of stocking about 100,000 yearlings produced over at the St. Mary's Fish Hatchery here. Um, back in 2012, for the purposes that I just indicated, and um, had been able to make that in 2012, 2013, and 2014. And that, that was a pretty big commitment to us because during most years, our total perch production at the hatchery was about 650,000 or so. We'd been struggling to make these fish. And through some infrastructure improvements and more pew working like a demon and learning some new things, we had a remarkable year this year. And um, you can see these numbers. We stocked more than 10 times that amount of fingerlings and this bonus of almost 17 million fry on top of it. So we don't know if we can expect that kind of production out of the hatchery every year or not. We'll certainly keep our fingers crossed. But um, as you guys know, it's, you know, raising fish is a little like farming. You kind of have good, good years and bad years. But what this has done is this has given us an excellent experiment and allowed us to put as many fish as we possibly could in this lake. And if we're going to see a response from perch stocking, it will come from this past year's stocking. So we're staying tuned and we're pretty excited about it. So Grand Lake is, is one of the few places that we stock with the idea of sort of establishing a self-sustaining population. Rarely do we do this. Most of the stockings that we do are what we call put-grow-take stockings. These are the ones for walleye or sawguy or catfish in a lot of places around the state where we have fish stocked at smaller sizes and we expect them to grow to larger sizes and that's when anglers catch and keep them or catch and release them. That's mostly what our programs do. And then we do a smattering of what we refer to as put and take stockings, the rainbow trout stockings that some of you may be familiar with. They're very expensive but they provide um, really nice opportunities especially for kids and families and some older folks that that we can provide in places that are really easy to access with guaranteed success. So whenever we stock fish, we step into that activity with some clear, clear guidance in mind related to some of our policies. And um, you know, we make these decisions based on things like the habitat suitability. Uh, we have to think hard about the watershed location. Here in Ohio in particular, we have to pay attention to whether something's stocked in the Ohio River or the Lake Erie watershed. Um, we have to think about the probability of survival of those fish once they hit the water. Um, we're always thinking about what anglers are interested in catching, and that's why we ask a lot of questions of, of people when we're on the water or through online surveys or through mail surveys. And we have to think about existing fisheries that, that are on the lake already, um, and of course hatchery capacity and our ability to raise certain numbers of fish, and then fish production costs. It is very true that in cases where um, Mother Nature is taking care of the fish stocking for us with natural reproduction, we just simply can't meet what Mother Nature can do. So that's why you'll see us stock um, very few or, or no um, catfish, black bass, crappie, or bluegill in large reservoirs. Because when there's natural reproduction, um, we can't even come close to providing what the system can itself. I mentioned how hatchery capacity is limited. This all just sort of caps what we think we can do, but when you continually improve the quality of the hatcheries, like we've done here at St. Mary's, sometimes you can expand the pie a little bit and do a little bit more than you thought you can. So we're pretty excited about uh, doing those kind of things, and, and we keep trying to provide more and more fish. 
And something that's unique to Grand Lake that, that I don't think any other lake except for Long Lake over in the Akron area um, has going for it is that you know two watersheds connect at this water body and that's that's been known in a long time for a long time so that sort of flavors what we can do and what we decide to stock in the lake especially recently um, so these dotted lines essentially show you the the boundary between the Ohio River and Lake Erie watersheds and um, there are always concerns about communication between those watersheds because Something we try really hard to do is prevent the movement of aquatic invasive species, critters like Asian carp, zebra mussels, or diseases like uh, VHS that you may have heard about. So there was a study by the federal government that identified a, a number of these kinds of locations where there were connections between the Mississippi River watershed and, and uh, the Great Lakes watershed in, in the states that border of the Great Lakes. And that has sort of amplified the concerns that all the states have about the communication between these two watersheds regarding aquatic invasive species. So what we've all done is work together to start in the direction of um, severing these connections. And here in Ohio, we have four connections. Three of them are important. One of them is right here. And we're investing dollars in, in the hatchery facility to try and sever the connections between these two watersheds and working with parks as well to do that. So you'll hear more about that in the future, but all of that pointed right at trying to prevent the movement of aquatic invasive species. So the, the way that has flavored our stocking is by um, requiring us to make some decisions about what we put in the lake and what might move out. So when we've stocked walleye in the past, um, they've been fished from Lake Erie, so if they got out and they made their way to Lake Erie, it would be okay. Um, we did uh, stocking of walleye for a decade. Um, we put over 50 million fry in the lake, almost 500 million fingerlings, and unfortunately we got very little return out of the lake. So we feel like it's not, just not the place to be stocking walleye. We tried experimental stocking of triploid sagai. These are a, a fish where you rearrange the genetic material through a heat and pressure treatment. Um, to try and make them sterile. Uh, we tried this in 2009 and 2010, and um, there were two issues that we encountered. One related to potential fish escapement, where um, if these fish escaped, we still weren't certain enough that the triploidy process was effective enough in making sure that they were sterile, so we'd have the risk of those fish making, them into, making it to Lake Erie, and that would be a problem. And the other thing was that it, through the process of developing these um, triploid fish, um, we just couldn't make enough of them really to consistently make a fishery. Um, very few fish survive this process of the pressure treatment in particular. So um, it was an experiment, we tried it, and it really didn't pan out in this case. So, um, you know, the, the $10 million question that we often get is, are these fish safe to eat in Grand Lake? And that came about really from 2010 and the, the word about harmful algal blooms. Um, here in Ohio and many other states, there are fish, or, fish advisory programs pointed at providing guidance for safe fish consumption. And we do that through a partnership with the Ohio EPA and the Ohio Department of Health. We work together, but our roles differ. In Division of Wildlife, we provide fish um, for the, the analysis and the processing, and we um, work on communication pieces with our neighboring agencies. Um, the goal of the program has always been to provide anglers with informed decisions about eating fish, and it's been pointed really at mercury and PCBs throughout the years. Now, the, the advisories work like this. You know, if you go to the EPA's website, you'll see some general guidance. The statewide advisory is to eat no more than one meal per week of sport caught fish unless there's um, a um, specific advisory in place. And this is very common throughout the United States. And then you'll see tables like this one for lake-specific information. For example, here at Grand Lake, if, if you chose to eat largemouth bass, because mercury levels are very low compared to other places, um, you could eat two meals per week of those fish. And for example, with yellow perch, you could eat two meals per week of those fish. So the emerging concern following the, the advent of a lot of attention to harmful algal blooms was uh, microcystin. And does this toxin 
possibly accumulate in fish tissue. And this has become a big concern both in Lake Erie and, and here at Grand Lake. So um, in 2010, we uh, did some sampling after the lake had a pretty rough year and um, worked with Ohio EPA and they had some analysis performed on the tissue from the State University of New York that specializes in this kind of thing. And all of the samples we sent were essentially what we refer to as non-detect. That means there was no microcystin, this toxicant, found in the fish tissue. So as a result of that, the advisory in 2010 that provided guidance to hold off on consuming fish was, was changed. And we're back to the regular one meal per week that you're familiar with from standard guidelines. We've continued to sample fish here for um, toxins in fish um, each of the years that followed 2010. So these are the results sort of summarized very quickly for you, all except 2015 has been analyzed. But out of the 2,210 210 samples that we've collected and analyzed, um, only about 2% of those have had um, detections for microcystin. And this, this makes sense. Um, the conventional wisdom among the science at this time is that um, this toxin accumulates mostly in the liver. Uh, fish tend to metabolize it quickly. And um, bioaccumulation, unlike PCBs and mercury, does not seem to be occurring. That's what we seem to know right now. And so our fish consumption guidance always points at don't eat the entrails. So that's an easy one to follow. Most people don't. So the, you know, the thing you'd be most worried about would be eating livers, and I don't think there's a lot of that going on. And really, that's, that's secondary to concerns about um, exposure to, to water when levels are high. So the thing that's important to remember here is that um, we're continuing to learn more about microcystin and fish tissue. Um, the information on this throughout the world is what we call an emerging science. More and more information is, is um, being found. And uh, we're going to keep plugged into this. So the way we're going to do that is, first, we think there's no reason for anyone to do anything but follow the, the current fish consumption advisory guidelines. And then we're also working with our partners at Ohio State University through our research project that we fund to um, look at methodologies for analysis of tissue. Um, and then we've started an annual monitoring program with them on both Grand Lake and Lake Erie. So we can learn more about this issue and if we see something that creates reason for concern to address it quickly. So what's next? Well, these are the tools that I, that I showed you early in the talk and the variety of things that we can do to manage fisheries. So we've used them. Um, stocking, you know, we attempted the walleye and saw guy stocking, uh, but we're moving full steam ahead with the yellow perch. Um, in terms of regulations for the, the three big species here, we have special regulations for each of them, and they seem to be working okay. In terms of law enforcement, Brian talked about how our officers, you know, certainly check when you're check to make sure you don't have short fish or too many fish, but they also work a lot of pollution cases and do other things, a lot of community outreach, and so they're an important part of this as well. Um, Deb and her group do a great deal of monitoring of the fishery. Um, we, we monitor fisheries throughout the state, so we can't go to every lake every year, but we do keep a beat on things, and that's, that's why we do these creel surveys periodically. Um, the next one here is scheduled for 2018, which is perfect because that'll be timed with teaching us how the yellow perch stocking went this year and if we're getting results. Um, bass electrofishing is scheduled for next year. Um, crappie trap netting not until 2018. So the research at Ohio State I talked about for the fish tissue analysis continues. Um, partnerships, again, a very strong and important part of this, not just with OSU, but with sister agencies on things like access and with the um, Department of Health, OEPA, on the fish tissue work. Um, new fishing access sites that we're considering, like at Little Chickasaw with the boat ramp. So we're pretty excited about that. And um, in terms of habitat restoration, that work here and the attention that the watershed is getting has really happened at a higher level with um, partnerships between um, EPA, Department of Agriculture, and ODNR as a whole. 
um, in terms of aquatic invasive species, our biggest effort here is working on that separation of the, the Ohio River and the Lake Erie watersheds at the hatchery. And the information and education, not only do our own staff do this, but we, um, we contrib contribute significant dollars to support the position that Milt Miller has at the Restoration Commission. So I guess what I'd, what I'd like you to go home with is remember that fishing continues to be good here. And this has been an exceptional fishery, and, and particularly when people talk about crappie bass and catfish. Things continue to roll on really well. Um, we're going to keep after this yellow perch program, and, and we hope it'll make a difference. Um, in terms of fish consumption, follow the standard guidance. There's just no reason to do otherwise right now. And um, in terms of our other activities, we're on track following uh, our schedule, and we have a lot of things coming up that we think are really helpful. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. You guys hung in there because this is a really long talk, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Scott, you have a few minutes to ask or answer some questions? Sure. Are you happy to do that? You want me to stand up with the mic Yeah, it probably be easier for me to Okay, please. Hi. I got uh, just three quick questions. Uh, where are the fingerlings released at Grand Lake? Is it like scattered around or in one particular spot? Right across the road from the hatchery. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so, they, they just so they may not fast. reach the, uh, the western end. No, they will. Is yes, okay. we, we have been in this business a long time, and when we stock, um, for example, we stock, is that feedback from that one? Yeah, that's okay. Better. When we stock, for example, um, our bigger reservoirs, when we stock the bigger reservoirs, we know from work that we've done that those very small fingerlings in a very short period of time will make it all the way down the lake. We typically, you know, we often stock, stock in headwaters. In this case, that's not the case, but they really distribute fast. I don't think you'll see them staying in one area because of that for long. What might you consider the mortality rate of these things? Well, for the yellow perch, I can't tell you for sure, but what I can tell you is with walleye and sawgye that we stock of the same sizes, um, if we get, um, say if we stock 100 fish in the, in the spring, um, if we get 10 of those to make it to the fall, that's good. And that's why we stock very high numbers. And so um, that always plays a part. It's a numbers game. And you know, that, that plays into the decisions about do we stock fingerlings and fry. And what we're learning from the mix of things we do around the state is um, sometimes you can actually do a better job by stocking fry than you can with fingerlings. Just depends on how the lake is set up and how the water moves through the lake. So um, when we stock, um, when we stock um, saw guy, for example, we'll stock like a, a hundred per acre or more. And when we stock um, saw guy fry, we would stock a thousand per acre. Um, so you stock more. A little bit longer. You know, a, a, a fry is just a few days after absorbing its yolk sac, so it's a very tiny, maybe a. Oh, that's smaller than a fingerling. Yeah, a fry is very tiny. A fingerling's in an inch and a half. Yeah. One last question. Yeah. When you send the, the uh, or did send the uh, uh, the samples for the fish for the uh, tissue analysis. Yes. And you said it was like two percent back and had the same micro uh, microsystem. Yeah. What species were, the, were those for the most part? You know, they were they were crappie. And we don't know why that is. What we actually did after after the first year we detected those in crappie is we intensified our efforts at sampling crappie the following year. And then we tried to look at whether different locations of the lake made a difference or different times of the year made a difference. And we really didn't see any pattern. Um, so we, we don't know why that would be the case, but that has been what we have found. But very few. I mean, it, it just seems like the fish don't seem to be accumulating it. So we're going to keep after it, though. Um, we, the, the sampling that we're, we're committed to doing with OSU is going to be done indefinitely on an annual basis at both Lake Erie and Grand Lake. Yeah. Anybody else? Any other questions? Hey, Scott, I know there's a lot of variables into the growth rates, but what would you 
Can you just throw something out there on these yellow perch on what we could expect for a growth rate on those? You know, I, I think we should see the ones that we're stocking in 2015, you know, the big bunch of them that we stocked this year. Geez, those fish, anywhere from six to nine inches by the time we get into 2019 or 2018 when we're running the creel surveys. There'll be a lot of variation that happens all the time, but Deb, does that sound pretty close to you? About three years, you're talking catchable, yeah, playable fish in about three years? It, it varies depending on where you're at in the state, but this is a really fertile lake, so we'd expect pretty quick growth rates. So, yeah, and that's why that, that krill survey should pair nicely with the stocking. We should see those fish recruiting to the fishery if, if we've done some good there. So, Anybody else? All right, Scott, thank you very much. Thanks for your time.